proclaim it. And let's stand to sing all four verses, 276. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through his infinite mercy, his child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Redeemed and so happy in Jesus, no language my rapture can tell. I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty. The King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guideth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. Thank you. You may be seated. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What a marvelous thought as we consider our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The marvelous grace of God in loving us, that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. What a magnificent thought. And something certainly worthy of, of being bold about sharing, something worthy of even dying for. We see that as we look at the book of Acts and we see the cost that the Christians paid. We see the boldness of the early apostles and the boldness of the early church. We see the boldness of Stephen in Acts 7. We see the boldness of Saul who will become the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, which is where we are tonight. Last week, you recall, we were looking at what to do when Christians don't trust you in Acts chapter 9, verses 26 through 28. And we saw Saul, immediately after his conversion, doing what was perhaps most dangerous for his health. We're all worried today about our health. We're all worried about what's going to happen to us and uh, what can we do to prolong life and prevent the onset of old age and death. Doesn't pay to worry about that. Doesn't matter how healthy you are, God can snuff out your life instantaneously if he wishes to do so. He can snuff it out while you're sleeping in bed or he can snuff it out while you're boldly testifying for Christ. What a better way to go, as Stephen did in Acts chapter seven. We might get old and die we might avoid all those things by taking all kinds of medicines and doing every whatever things. And we should try to care for our bodies because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But our motivation should not be fear. And that was one of the things that we saw very clearly in the passage of last week. We found that the Christians in Jerusalem were afraid of Saul. They were afraid of what the other Jews would do to them. They were afraid of what Saul would do to them if he found them. They were worried about their health. <laughs> it 
Of course, Saul himself, by returning to Jerusalem, placed himself in jeopardy. As when Saul came to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. We saw in that passage, as you recall, that his boldness was immediate after an attempt on his life, and probably the word of his conversion had reached Jerusalem in advance. We saw that God often puts us where he can test our faith and obedience. We saw that still Paul had, or Saul had unsaved family members in Jerusalem. We saw that Saul still had connections whom he wanted to witness to. We saw that Jerusalem was where the largest church was located at that time. We saw Jerusalem was where Saul was most known and feared by the Christians, the ones that he had missed in his earlier pogrom of that city. We saw that Saul wanted the same close fellowship that he had experienced in Damascus. He essayed to join himself to the disciples. And that brought us to the main theme for the message last week, which related to fear versus faith. I want to tie the message tonight together with that by reminding us of a very important principle. There are always multiple costs and multiple prices for every decision that we make. The message tonight is entitled, Peace at a Price. Remember, everything you get is going to have a cost to it. Multiple costs and prices for every decision that you make, every turn that we take, everything that either slows us down or speeds us up, there's a cost to everything that we want to do with our lives. There is a cost in terms of money. There is a cost in terms of time. You only have a limited amount and you do not know when it will run out. Use it wisely. You cannot waste time. All you do is waste your life. There is a cost in terms of health in the decisions that we make. There is a cost in terms of the priorities that we set. There is a cost in terms of the goals that we want to reach. There will always be a cost in our expenditure of energy, a cost in our focus of love, our cost in our focus of what we think about, a cost to the focus of our balance between time and and eternity. Tonight we're talking about peace at a price. Last week we talked about the cost or price that we pay for having the fear of man and the cost or the price that we pay in every case of fear. The fear of man has a cost. They were all afraid of him. The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. We saw what a, an incredible, overwhelming issue fear is in the Bible. 385 times it shows up. The word afraid shows up 189 times in addition to that. We saw that fear is a basic human condition dating back to the Garden of Eden. We saw that fear comes when we have inappropriate behavior. We saw that fear is focused on self and possessions. And I want to pause and just mention something. That's even among fundamentalist ministries today. They attempt to motivate you by fear to sell their books and tapes. Now, you know, I'm a fundamentalist. I believe the Bible is the word of God. But I do not believe that the motivation that we should use is fear. We are to walk by faith. That means you don't worry and you don't be afraid of all those bad things that are out there that people are telling you about. And they are out there, and they are bad things, and you might get killed by them. But that's no reason to be afraid of them. You see, fear focuses on temporal things. Human fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the holy is understanding. But the fear of man... The fear of things in this life, the fear of loss of possessions or loss of health or loss of whatever else you can think of means that you are not walking by faith. 
this magazine that I had picked up yesterday, and uh, just glancing over it, it was a good Bible-believing fundamentalist publication selling a book that urges you to protect your possessions for the bad times that are coming. And it went on and on about how you'd better be sure that, you know, you've got everything hedged in and just buy this book for 20 bucks and uh, you'll be okay. You know, that's the wrong focus. It's a focus on fear instead of a focus on faith. Fear is focused on self and personal possessions. And we saw many illustrations of that last week. Fear tends to blame God for not doing his job of protecting us. We saw that clearly with Joseph's brothers who said, after they found the money in their sacks, they were afraid, saying one to another, what is this that God hath done unto us? Fear makes us commit stupid acts and it makes us say stupid things and makes us blame God. The only appropriate fear is the fear of the Lord, and I think Paul understood that. We also noted last week that God uses men of courage who are not afraid, and we looked at Gideon and his 300. We saw courage comes from faith, and faith removes stress. And we looked at half a dozen verses, or more than that, where it's very clear that faith removes stress. We saw that fear is a particular temptation for women and weak men. Many verses of scripture on that. We saw that obedient preparation and being in the center of God's will will remove both fear and stress. We saw that fear increases as we get older unless it is actively countered by faith. Very clear illustrations in Ecclesiastes 12. We saw that the fear of man not only brings a snare, but it also causes injustice, clearly stated in Deuteronomy 1.17. We noted there are certain fears that we should have. Fear should come when we are disobedient to the will of God because he sees everything that he do. And he will give us the chastening that is necessary to make us walk by faith. We saw how a believer is supposed to respond to the many sources of fear. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We saw whom we trust when we're afraid. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. And many other verses as well. The command to fear not occurs 63 times in the Bible because we are by nature fearful. We always expect something bad to happen or refuse to believe that God is in control causing something good to happen. And we know, not we guess, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. When we really believe that, it removes fear, it removes stress, it removes worry. Now, we may be under pressure at various times. The issue is, how do we respond when the pressure comes? And we saw that even Paul had been told not to fear. Acts 27, 24, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. This is in the middle of a hurricane where everything has been thrown overboard and everybody on board has decided we're going down with the ship. That was a point of stress for everyone, including Paul, but the angel of God stood by him and said, Fear not, Paul, I've guaranteed that you're going to get to Rome. And as a token of my kindness, all 276 people on board this ship are going to live through it, even the ones that cannot swim. And God proved himself true. We'll get to that when we get to Acts 27. When the believers were afraid, what were they missing? They missed fellowship. They missed Bible teaching. They missed insight into the inner workings of the Sanhedrin because Paul had been an insider and knew what they would do. They missed identification with the greatest evangelist and church planner who ever lived. They missed insights into the greatest theologian who ever lived. They missed insights into the grace of God to sinners by being afraid and refusing to fellowship with Paul. And then we talked about what makes other people distrust us. Human nature that is prone to fear even when there is nothing to fear. We call it paranoia today. 
that is, irrational fears. Selfishness in protecting what we own, who we are, and what we think are our own best interest. The selfish gene, which is the main theory of evolutionists who realize they can't prove evolution. So they come to the conclusion, God is not there, therefore we do only what is in our own best interests. What makes other people distrust us? What the other person reveals himself to be. Cynical refusals to believe that someone can change. And then we saw how to make other people trust you. You need a daysman. You need an Ananias in Damascus, a Barnabas in Jerusalem. Someone who is already trusted and who will act as a go-between to vouch for your integrity. You see, lack of trust comes from lack of integrity. And we talked about how every time you let people down, you build more distrust. Little things like not keeping your word, consistently being late, failure to finish what you start, being unfaithful when someone is relying on you. Confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. Proverbs 25, 19. How to make others trust you? There must be a radical change in your life. A radical change in your life. Where now you no longer do the things that you did when you were unsaved. Now you no longer talk the way you talked when you were unsaved. Now you no longer think the way you used to think when you were unsaved. Your attitudes are different from that past. Your motives are different from the former things. You have been changed by Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that brings us to tonight, the peace at a price. Verse 29, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, clearly he had been changed, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Does that sound like a familiar theme that we've seen before in the book of Acts? Which, when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus, sent him back to his home city. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. That seems like a rather odd conclusion to Saul going back to his home city. We'll talk about that, the Lord willing, in a few moments. But as we look at this short passage, only three verses long, we discover that it ends a major section of the book of Acts. As verse 31 ends, it is a transition for the reader to verse 32, back to the ministry of Peter. We see Saul going back to Tarsus, and verse 32 picks up with Peter. We're going to see a section about Peter, and then we're going to see, and it's a very important section about Peter. If it were not there, you and I would not be here tonight. Because as we move into the ministry of Peter, and what happens in Acts chapter 10, we're going to discover that God, in his merciful grace, has chosen to bring Gentiles into the body of Christ. And so we stop looking at Saul with these three verses for a period of time as we go through the book of Acts. The last time we saw Peter was in Acts 8.20 where he was placing a curse on Simon the magician. So these three verses also teach us many important and critical things in three different areas. It's sort of a summary that's going to happen here where God is telling you, this is how things work out when you do it my way. He doesn't want to leave us hanging. He wants to let us know what happens when Saul goes back to Tarsus. What did God do by what occurred in the life of Saul that brought about the peace that we discover taking place in verses 30 and 31? They teach us three things in three critical areas. Number one, they teach us much about the character of Saul. Number two, they teach us much about the character and responsibility of local churches. And number three, they teach us the methods that God uses to establish peace and biblical church growth. 
A lot is contained in these three verses. First, the character of Saul. As we look at this verse, verse 29, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. We learn a number of things about his character. Number one, he clearly proved himself in the eyes of the believers as a champion of the faith, and thus he vindicated the trust that Barnabas had put in him. When another believer trusts you and puts his confidence in you, is that trust vindicated by how you handle whatever that trust was? Very clearly, we see here he proved himself in the eyes of the believers there at Damascus as a champion of the faith and vindicated the trust that Barnabas had put in him. The second thing we learn as we see him boldly disputing in the name of the Lord Jesus is he clearly proved by his actions and speech that a genuine transformation had occurred in his life. It was not merely an outward profession of faith. There are many people today sitting in churches, even so-called evangelical churches, which have compromised on basic issues of scripture. And so these people, having made an outward profession of faith, but having no inward change or no reality of spirit-filled living, feel quite comfortable to sit in those pews and listen to the pablum that is babbled from the pulpit. There is never any challenge to their lifestyles. There is never any challenge to their modus operandi. There is never any challenge to the compromises that are in their lives. There is never any talk of sin. There is never any talk of hell. There is never any talk of judgment or even of chastening of the Lord. And they feel quite comfortable as they sit in their pews in their shorts and t-shirts and sipping their copy, which they bought at a little coffee boutique out in the lobby of the, quote, evangelical church. We see here with Saul, he proved by his actions and speech that a genuine transformation had occurred in his life, not merely an outward profession. Thirdly, and I think this is important, especially in light of what's going on in the so-called evangelical church today, Saul was energetically involved in, believe it or not, confrontational evangelism, not lifestyle evangelism. He was actively and energetically involved in confrontational evangelism. When was the last time you had confrontational evangelism where you specifically brought up the subject of the Lord Jesus Christ and insisted on carrying on that conversation and as the person to whom you're witnessing began to make his objections you systematically demolished them <laughs> can you even remember one occurrence in your life where that occurred we're so much into the well that's not politically correct type of mentality so much into the well, let's just sort of get to know them and maybe, maybe an opportunity will open up where I can say something about, well, the Lord was good to me today. Your people, that's not what we see with the Apostle Paul. That will not lead to what we find in the last two verses of our passage tonight, where there is peace in the churches, where there is church growth, biblical church growth. What follows immediately after Saul's confrontations and their attempts to kill him, and he finally is able to leave the area, what do we find? He has been openly, publicly debating the truth of the gospel. And there have been people listening to it who, when they've heard that word, it has sunk deep into their hearts, and they have believed, and the church begins to grow. There have to be those who are willing to step out by faith confrontationally, lovingly, but confrontationally, so that others will hear. You may not win the one with whom you are disputing, and that's what it says he was doing here. We'll talk about that in a moment. You may not be able to win the ones with whom you are disputing, 
But any public disputing done in the manner that Paul did it, which we'll talk about in a moment, will have other hearers who are outside of that conversation for the moment, but who understand the argument, are not caught up in the emotion, and who understand and believe the truth as the Holy Spirit works in their hearts. When was the last time that you were involved in what we might call confrontational evangelism and not merely that which is very popular in the church today, lifestyle evangelism? The fourth thing that we discover as we look at this initial verse in verse 29 is that Saul used reasoned argument, what we call today apologetics. That doesn't mean you're apologizing for something. It is a form of argumentation based on reason, not feel-good emotions. It's evangelism not based on how you think about something because it makes you warm and fuzzy inside. It was not evangelism based on funny stories. It was not evangelism based on graphic descriptions of his sordid past. It was not based on any of the other evangelistic tricks that have been used historically. The word dispute here in this passage is one of several words. We find several Greek words that translate the word dispute. This word is susateo. It means to investigate jointly. That is, two people are involved in resolving a question. It means to question an issue with reason. Paul wasn't, or Saul at this point, was not ugly about it. But he was forceful. He was irrefutable. He was logical. And he soundly and passionately argued his opponents into the ground. They were shamefully and publicly brought to defeat. Nobody likes that when it happens to them. They were shamefully and publicly brought to defeat. For example... This is exactly the same word, this word dispute, that is used of Stephen in Acts 6-9. Stephen was a logical, irrefutable proponent of the faith of Christ. Do you remember something? Saul had heard Stephen, and Saul was the one who stood by and held the coats of those who were stoning Stephen. Saul knew already, when we get here to Acts 9, Saul already knew what would happen if he used the same irrefutable proofs that Stephen had used. In a way, when he witnessed Stephen's death, I think God was preparing Saul for what was to come. Saul had now stepped into Stephen's shoes to take his place since Stephen had been removed with the help of Saul. And that brings us to a very important principle. Remember this well. God often uses us to the correct the sins which we have committed at the cost of others. Saul's participation was part of what cost Stephen his life. And now God is going to use Saul to correct that sin, whereas Stephen could have had, had God chosen to do it a different way, a long and productive life. Stephen was a man full of faith, and he wrought miracles and wonders. He had the same gifts that Saul would later have. He used reasoned argumentation and logic to refute the gainsayers. They could not stand against his argumentation. And so what did they want to do? They wanted to kill him. Saul knew that's what happens to those who are articulate in the faith. And God is taking Saul and going to turn him into Paul and make him the one who will be articulate in the faith using argument reasoned argumentation to defeat the voices of the enemy. 
Remember Acts 6, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. Wisdom. Wisdom to know which arguments to use against the opponent. Empowered not by human strength, but by the Spirit of God. You know what happened at the end of Acts 7. They stoned him to death. They suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous and wor blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They stirred up all the people, the elders and the scribes, and came on him, caught him, and brought him to the council. Here he is before the Sanhedrin. Saul is going to have to stand before the Sanhedrin. They set up false witnesses which said, He speak, ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. We looked at those four charges when we were in Acts 6. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. Focus on buildings, not on God's truth and obedience. We talked about that this morning. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him and saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And so we find God picking up at that particular point, that is the point before the council, in Saul's life, because Saul or Paul would have to stand before the same council when he was later caught in Acts 16 in Jerusalem and rescued by the Roman centurions and soldiers out of the Antonia Fortress. But we go back now to verse 29 in our text. He spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. He disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So who were the Grecians? Well, we had a list of four different groups which would fit in that category as we were looking at Stephen. The Grecians were the intellectual Jews. This wasn't, he was arguing a bunch against a bunch of mobsters who couldn't speak strict English and the only thing that they knew how to do was pull a trigger. He was speaking against the intellectual Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, composed of both proselytes, because it says so, and upper crust, wealthy intelligentsia Hebrews, who were not used to being crossed in their opinions. You know, most rich people are not very interested in hearing you express a different opinion than they have. They're used to bossing people around. They're used to having their own way. They're used to doing their own thing. And they don't want your opinion. Certainly not having you cross them and prove that they're wrong. The proselytes, according to Jesus, were more fervent and vicious, if that's possible, than these genetic descendants of Abraham who were standing against Paul. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 23:15: Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he is made ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Whoa. Those are pretty hard words, and they come from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we find that it is both the Greek Jews and the proselytes that are gathered together against both Stephen and Saul. And so we have hot debates, logical reasoning by one of the most highly trained men of his day, that is Saul, against the wealthy intelligentsia and the proselytes who had been thoroughly convinced of rabbinic Judaism by prior reasoning with the Pharisee missionary zealots. And these proselytes were not about to give up what they had embraced and make any more changes in their lives. We find that Saul had been well trained by one of the most brilliant Jewish rabbis in all of history, one of the seven Rambans of Jewish history. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people. Saul claims to have been trained by Gamaliel. That was from Acts 5. Here in Acts 22, he says, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus. Remember in our text, that's where he's going back to and then we see the peace occurring in Jerusalem. 
Born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city, that is in Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Saul could have empathy with these people who were trying to kill him. <laughs> Do you think you would have empathy with people who are zealously trying to kill you? But you see, Saul understood that he had once been where they were. When we begin to understand that we used to be there, that but for the grace of God, there go I, until we begin to understand that, we cannot have an earnest love or desire to see those people out there come to Christ. We'll have no desire to witness to them because they smell bad, they look bad, they look mean, they've got tattoos, or whatever the problem is. Until we understand, but for the grace of God, there go I. As Paul says to them, I was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. In the same manner that you're zealous toward God, I was zealous. But how God changed his life and gave him a willingness to go to those who more than anything else in the world wanted to kill him. That's what motivates many missionaries and has through the centuries to go to places where in fact they have been killed. You think of the five martyrs to the Aka Indians in Ecuador back in the 50s. You think of others who have gone into the jungle and been slain. Those who've gone to China. Some, for example, under Hudson Taylor, who died within weeks after they were there because of diseases. You think of those who have gone to India and to Burma, many of whom have given their lives for the faith. They knew in advance what might happen. But the love of Christ compelled them. They went and overcame fear by faith. That's what we see about the character of Saul here. Saul had character. He had the courage of convictions. Saul had a thorough knowledge of scripture. Don't try to step out without any knowledge of scripture and win others by your mere power of reasoning. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about Saul's logical argumentation, his apologetics. We're talking about a man who knew the scriptures and with the word of God could confront and confound the adversary. Do you know the word? Saul had integrity that would not compromise. Saul was not intimidated by the most vicious group of men imaginable. This is what we might call Saul's baptism of fire here in Jerusalem to see if he would be ready for the rest of his ministry. And as you know, he passed that test with flying colors. God tested him as he did with Abraham when God told Abraham to go to Mount Moriah and there to sacrifice his son Isaac. And God got, let him go all the way to the point of building the altar, laying the wood, binding Isaac, putting Isaac upon the wood, and raising the knife before God said, Avraham, Avraham, Vayomersh. I'm sorry, uh, God said, uh, here am I, Hineni. God said at the very last moment, don't touch the lad. Now I know. Now I know. Did God know in advance through his omniscience? Of course he knew. But God brought Abraham to the point so that together they would have this bond of knowledge, the intimate, closest knowledge, where Abraham, yes, demonstrated that he put God first, even on, over his... Monogonese, his only begotten son. Yes, he had Ishmael 
But God calls Isaac his only son. Dear friends, have you been through the baptism of fire, so to speak, where you have passed the test of faith that puts God first above everyone and everything that you love? God demonstrated to Saul and God demonstrated to us that Saul would not flinch in the face of all future opposition. If he could stand up to that group of adversaries, nothing else could stand in the way. You know, he got sort of used to having people try to kill him for his Christian testimony. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22. He's speaking about those who have come in teaching other doctrines, other gospels, and uh, who are trying to lead believers astray. And he says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. They don't have anything on me, says Saul. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. None of us can say any of that stuff. I mean, did we ever labor more abundantly than Saul? Did we ever get beaten above measure? He couldn't even count the number of times he'd been beaten. How many times have you been in prison for your faith? How many times have you faced death? We've already seen several of them where they're laying wait to try to kill him. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one, the thirty-nine that were permitted under rabbinic tradition. That's in addition to the stripes above measure, where he got beaten up, where he got stoned, for example. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. We know about one of those. A night and a day I have been in the deep. That was not the time when he got shipwrecked on the island of Melita. <laughs> but at one of his other shipwrecks, he floated around in the ocean for a day and a half. Has that ever happened to any of us? You see, God let him go through the test at Jerusalem to put steel into his soul, to give him the courage of integrity and character that would not flinch into compromise when push came to shove. The night and the day I have been in the deep in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. You know, he's just summarizing for us here stuff that isn't even recorded in the book of Acts. In perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness. Doesn't matter where I go, I'm in trouble. <laughs> he couldn't escape it. In perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, phony Christians in weariness and painfulness. You say, man, I wouldn't want to do that. It might hurt. In weariness and painfulness. I wouldn't want to do that because, you know, I'd really get tired. Dear people, you know, we are supposed to take care of our bodies, but not at the expense of our testimony. Oh, how we need to learn that. America is bent over backwards, and I speak as a father of seven doctors, a meant meant in America are bent over backwards trying to take care of their health rather than trying to serve Jesus Christ, regardless of the cost. in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, we can't even skip a meal, in fastings often. When was the last time you fasted? In cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without. In other words, that's all that outside stuff. But you know what really concerned Saul, what really brought a burden to his spirit? 
that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. <laughs> Amazing. It was a greater burden to Saul's spirit than all those horrendous things that were happening to his body. Because his love for the churches, for these whom he had led to Christ, for these whom he had trained in the faith, for these whom he had prayed for and prayed with and prayed over, that was a heavier burden for him to bear than beatings and stonings and shipwrecks and running away. It was a harder thing to bear taking care of the churches. That tells you where his heart was. That brings us to the second and third lessons in the passage, and we're already over time. Remember, we talked about how these three verses teach us three important areas. The character of Saul, the character and responsibility of the local churches, and the methods God uses to establish peace and biblical church growth. Let me just summarize quickly. Maybe we'll have a little time to develop it next week. Which, when the brethren knew, they knew that there's a group out there trying to kill him. Isn't it interesting how when Saul was doing God's work, there was a network of Christians that knew what was coming. We've already seen that in the past. Apparently some kind of a network among the believers who knew what was going on with their persecutors and what the persecutors were trying to do. A spy network, if you will. The brethren knew about a plot to kill Saul. So what did they do? They brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. They understood their responsibility in the protection and provision for the one who had led them to Christ, been their fellow companion as a Christian, had taught them God's word, and they protected him. You know, we see that throughout history as well. In times of persecution, how many times there have been believers who have sought to protect the ones that the enemy was trying to kill. Satan always understands the principle that if you can knock off leadership, or as Jesus put it, smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And so Satan focuses in on those men who are effective in their teaching of the word of God and in their leadership of the body of Christ. The believers, when they're functioning properly, know their responsibility to care and protect. And they not only knew, but it says they didn't send him down to Caesarea, they brought him down to Caesarea. Now, we're going to talk about later on, Saul going to, when he's Paul, going to Caesarea and also going to be accompanied but by a group of horsemen and a group of spearsmen and other Romans to make sure he escapes another plot on his life. Here it is the believers that God uses to get him safely under their escort to Caesarea. And then they sent him forth to Tarsus. God said, all right, Saul, you have proved yourself at Jerusalem. Now I'm going to send you someplace else that perhaps might be more difficult. I'm going to send you back home. I'm going to send you back to the place where you were born. And you're going to be a witness for me there. You know, it's interesting. Our Lord Jesus Christ was raised in Nazareth. And when he went back to Nazareth, and when he sat in the synagogue and read the Isaiah scroll, 61 verses 1 and 2, we mentioned that this morning. And he said, this day are these sayings fulfilled in your ears. And then he went on to talk about how there were lepers in the day of Elias and there were 
he was not sent to heal any of them. And then there was a woman from Tyre and Sidon where he was sent and he wasn't sent to the widows in Israel. He began to point out some of these things. What did they do? They got very angry. What did they want to do with him? They took him to a brow of the hill outside of Nazareth and were going to cast him down and kill him. People don't like their preconceived ideas, especially in the realm of theology, challenged. The church sent him back to the place that he was born, sent him back to Tarsus. And the third thing was the methods that God uses to establish peace and biblical church growth. We mentioned that just in passing at the beginning. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Wow, that's great. We're multiplied. I think we see two things at work here. Number one, we discover that there were those who were listening and those who were strengthened and encouraged who were already believers. New people coming to Christ because they had heard the bold and unafraid testimony of Saul. And they said, that's the kind of faith I want, not the dead faith of rabbinic Judaism, which very clearly has given me nothing. Number two, we see that it give a tremendous encouragement to the believers who were there and a tremendous unity among the believers where they are willing to share and fellowship with one another. But the second area, which perhaps is a very practical thing that God did here. The Jews had focused so much on Saul and so much on his outgoing testimony and so much energy trying to stop him that when he finally left town, they collapsed in exhaustion, wiped their brows and knocked the sweat on the floor and said, man, he's gone. Let's forget them for a while, those Christians over there. We don't need to worry about those guys because Saul is gone. <laughs> you know, when we're an open testimony, it does affect those who are on the sidelines listening. Some of them come to Christ. It does affect those who are already Christians by giving them courage and boldness. But you know, it also produces when God moves a man on, as he did here with Saul, under the protection of the believers, then God brings supernaturally the peace and growth of the church. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, but not just Judea, and Galilee, and Samaria. You mean one man, having caused all that trouble, one man having left the region, suddenly there is this massive movement of quiet in which God causes church growth. His way. His way based on a ministry of a man whom others might consider a rabble-rouser. But God used it to bring peace and growth and comfort of the Holy Ghost and edification. And did you get that one phrase, walking in the fear of the Lord? They were no longer afraid of men. When he first came to town, they were afraid to let him join with them. But their position has been completely reversed. Their viewpoint has been transformed. They're no longer walking in the fear of man. They're now walking in the fear of the Lord. And as a result, they have the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They are edified they have rest, and they multiply. 
important lessons for us to learn. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you again for your word and for its power. How we thank you for the mercy that you showed to the believers at Jerusalem. Yes, they were saved. Yes, they'd even had apostolic leadership. But there were some things that needed to be worked out in their lives where they saw a man whom they first feared, then welcomed hesitantly, then made a full part of their body, and then allowed to be in leadership where he taught them and trained them, and where he set the personal example for them so that they no longer feared man, but they had the fear of the Lord. And at that point, you saw fit to move Saul to the next stage of his ministry. We pray, Father, that you will cause us to learn the lessons that we as a church need to learn, the things that are necessary to produce peace and church growth and comfort of the Holy Ghost and rest and multiplication so that your word might again go forth with power from this place to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. For we pray it in his name. Amen.